Okay, so I'm going to be talking about behavioral analytics tonight, um, and this is something I, I get pretty pumped up about. Uh, I do a lot of open source work, and a lot of it's in behavioral analytics. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but behavioral analytics is about understanding kind of how people act and why people do what they do. <clears throat> Excuse me, quite some allergies today. So, you know, I usually give people like a, a definition, but I find it's easier just to, to go with an example. So, uh, real quick though, first I'll give you some background on me. Uh, I used to be a horrible DBA for years. Uh, I kind of left that to get into uh, data visualization at a behavioral analytics company here in town. So, yeah, what is behavioral analytics? I always get this question the first time, you know, whenever I talk to people about this. Uh, I'll go through a little example here. So, you know, let's say that you are, you're a company and you have a web app, you're, you're SaaS, you have subscriptions or people buy stuff or whatnot. And you want to try to figure out, you know, you have all this data, you feel like you're doing pretty well, but you feel like you could be doing better. So, you, know, you start thinking about where your data is, and you have, you have a SQL database, you know, Jack, you got that. And you probably have a whole bunch of logs you know, you never look at. So, you got those two pieces right there. And, you know, first let's, let's start with the SQL and try to figure out and derive some insight about, you know, what our users do. So, what are our users doing? This is kind of a, a fundamental question. You know, it's, you don't, a lot of times we don't really understand how people act. So, let's say, what, the, what are they doing? So, for the sake of this talk, let's say that we, we put all our data for, you know, page views into a, a page views table. So we're going to query that. Now we have, you know, we're going to take no amazing SQL here. This is, you know, it's the URL and the count. So we're going to figure out what pages people are hitting. We got a pretty little graph here. We're going to run this. And we have, you know, people hitting the home page. Some people go to see what our company is about. And then we have some pricing and we have signups. You know, you know, not as many people go into pricing go to signups. So people kind of drop off, but this is some good information to know. So you might want to break this down further and you know, get some kind of demographics. So you have, you know, who is doing this stuff. So we can join onto our users table here with our page views and get some kind of gender information. We'll you know, roll up by that. So here you can see, you know, some more women come to the site that don't really better about us page as much. And this is kind of interesting information, but nothing really actionable so far. You know, we can also split off, you know, maybe there's gender, but we want to talk about where people are coming from. You know, we can, we can split off by a city here, and we have you know, users tables and page views. You know, we get this fancy graph where people come from different cities and hit these different pages, but it doesn't, it doesn't really give us a way to optimize, you know, what to do with this. And so far, this, this stuff isn't behavioral analytics. This is just us running SQL to get some kind of insight about our, our users. So you might also, you know, if you want to get trends about over time, you know, what people do, you can start putting that in there. So we'll, we'll throw in the URL, we have a date format with, you know, a year and a month, and we'll group off of that. And here we, we get kind of a cool little graph where, you know, we see, see things trending upward, that's a good sign with month over month growth. Uh, and we have a little drop off here on signups for April. You know, that's a problem, but we should figure that one out. But you know, this is good training information to figure out. So you know, SQL fundamentally works great for these kinds of questions. You know, you have, you have the what, the who, the when, and kind of the where. You know, these are things that just you know state about your things you want to track. And uh, but you know, we want to we want to get further beyond the state and you know get something about what people actually how people actually act. So how do we understand these actions and uh, you know, and, and understand how they relate to each other, how they relate over, over time. So, you know, you could think about how people are doing this. So, you know, how is a really interesting question in that it's not just a, a point in time, not just rolling up information. You have to relate actions to other actions. Uh, you know, it's a multi-step process, too. So, you know, here we'll, we'll do an example where we have, like, a, like users checking out. You know, someone doesn't just hit your checkout button and they're done, you know, they go, they check out, they do a uh, credit card information, you know, confirm it, and then, you know, they're done. So, you know, we pull out the SQL query and we think about this, and it gets, it's kind of gnarly because 
you have this huge SQL table of page views, then you have to find you know, your checkout page, and then you want to find the next immediate row after that. So here we're going to take page views and go and join onto a subquery where it goes onto the user ID and we're finding the next immediate row. And this will work for you know some small tables. Once you get to larger though, it just this it probably won't come back. It'll just run forever. This is going to take a while. But assuming we have a small table and we run this, we can see this is kind of an interesting graph. So we have we have people coming in. They put in the credit card information. So this is the <clears throat> this is the action immediately after a checkout. So people put in credit card information. That's what we want them to do. And we also have people that you know, they go and look at a different product. So this is kind of like their uh, they're continuing shopping. Continuing shopping. Then we have an index page. They're going back to the home page for some reason. Then we have this huge column on the right, which is null. So these are people that don't have like a next action really. These are people that actually, they drop off, they abandon the shopping cart, and may not come back. So this is, this is lost revenue right there. If we can find a way to, you know, pull this information, or pull these people over here into one of these other columns, you know, we can increase engagement, keep people around, and, uh, you know, really kind of just help grow our business. So that's kind of the how. Now why is an interesting question, too, that very much relates to how. So we have, you know, how goes forward, in our timeline, we want to figure out, you know, actions going along in a, in a process. Why means going the other way, where we, what leads up to that action. So here we have, you know, users canceling accounts. So we want to figure out why do they, they come to cancel the account. Yeah. So we'll pull out the SQL editor again, and we get something that's kind of similar. So, but we're basically, we're, instead of finding the, the next row that occurs after, in this page view that occurs, uh, we want to find the one that came before it for that user. So we're going to join up to the subquery here and find the one right before cancel account and uh, try to figure out what the, the immediate previous action was. So here's here's the graph that we have back. And we have you know, people that are coming from the help page. You know, these are people that they're going to figure out an answer to some problem they're having. And, you know, it's they're not, they're not figuring it out and they're going to go cancel their account, which is they're not happy. You know, this index page, people are coming to your site, you know, maybe they got an email or like maybe they got charged, and you know, they're coming onto their site to go cancel. So you might want to incentivize them to figure out how to keep them. You know, here's a 404 page, so you know your website, which is it broke for some reason, it's probably not the first time, and you know, now they're dropping off, they're canceling their account. And uh, finally here's contact us. You know, they're going to actually get a phone number and call in and talk to somebody and you know they don't like what they heard. So, what's that? Oh, okay. What's that? Okay. So, behavioral analytics is about understanding the how and the why. So, those those are the kind of key questions in related behavior. So, you know, we can do this kind of stuff in Hadoop. You know, this um, some people are doing this in Hadoop right now, and you know, this is it's not an easy task necessarily. So, you know, look at this. We first have to go through and parse all the logs that we have. And then after that, you know, we're going to have to sort all that stuff by user, which takes a while. And then we're going to have to break down those kind of timelines of each user into sessions where we have idle time in between. And I try to understand each visit to the site. And then you have to kind of match on that stuff to find, you know, someone who checks out what they do next. Then you have to roll all this information up and return it. And then finally, you just, you know, swear repeatedly because you're going to have to do this kind of, you know, you're going to have to rewrite this stuff every time you actually want to run this. So about a year ago, uh, I started this project called Sky. And uh, I, I kind of asked this question, you know, why there's not really like a, a system out there or like a way to really describe how to describe behavior. So I kind of set out to try to figure that out and explore a little bit. And this is kind of the, the little journey I took, I suppose. So can you guys hear me out there? So. The question is really like, what is behavior? So we can take this and we can see that you know behavior has to do with actions, what people do. But you know, it's not just actions. You, know, you want to combine that with the state, like the actual properties of your users or whatever you're tracking, and try to you might want to split by some kind of demographic. And then finally, all this stuff kind of goes. You know, we want to understand how this relates over time. 
and you have to click on at this point in time, or they do later on. So when I was first kind of modeling this out and figuring it out, I really thought that actions, those are kind of like the key, the hard piece to figure out. Uh, but really what I came to is, you know, I had a hard time describing time. So like, it's an interesting concept when you really think about it. Um, and I, I really kind of, I look towards like natural language a lot. Uh, so, you know, like in the English language, you know, we have a lot of constructs for time. So we talk about like past tense and future tense, things like that. And kind of the thing that was missing for me was when. So this is kind of, you know, when something happens. It's, it kind of describes a lot about time. <clears throat> so here's a couple little examples here. So this is, this is a lot of the, the language that I use within this project I have called Sky. So let's say we want to figure out like a simple hit count. You know, people go into your home page. So we can say, you know, when someone goes to your home page, then we'll just count it and we'll just add one. It's real simple. And this is the most boring query in the whole slide deck. 100 people went to our home page. And next, you know, you might want to break this down further. You can say, you know, let's say men and women. How do they do this? So you can say, you know, when they go to the home page, we'll count it, but, you know, group by gender, get some kind of dimension in there. You know, run this, and we get men and women, you know, see how many of each go. So you can do all this kind of stuff with SQL, it's not hard. Um, but we were using this when construct. I'm sorry if I'm missing the obvious, but how are you getting that data in the first place? How are we getting it? So this is usually from like, uh, from like log data or, you know, stuff, kind of page views. You can think of it as, as kind of like, a, you know, the data used in the Google Analytics, for example. You know, that kind of stuff, if you're logging it, back to this, this guy. Um, because, but yeah, you can definitely, you know, let me know if you guys have questions as well. Do you have to, uh, do you have to predetermine those dimensions? Like if you, you have to be like, I want, I'm going to think about gender in two months. Let's start storing, breaking this out, or can you uh, you'll have to, make up those distinctions? Oh, uh, I mean, you'll have to store it, you know, whenever you want to use it eventually, but when you actually do the querying, it'll actually do that. Um, you don't have to pre-fill that in beforehand. So now we use you know this when construct around how and try to figure out how the users check out. So we can nest these when statements, which is where it kind of gets interesting. So you can say when someone checks out, then within one step. So you know it's great if you think about this stuff as like a timeline and individual timelines too. So you have a user, and they come in, you're gonna look at all their, their events that come in or all their actions. You're going to say, when it's a checkout, you know, move one step over, and then we'll, we'll set the count right there, and we'll group by, you know, the actual action of the, that step immediately after the checkout. So we run this, and we get the same thing as our SQL query, which is the, the subquery join craziness, and, you know, same idea. But, you know, what happens if you want to say, well, you know, people go from checkout, and then they enter the credit card information, what happens after that? So, so in SQL you have to do, you know, join two subqueries, and it's it's a nightmare. But here we can start just nesting further. So we can say when, you know, when someone checks out, and then within one step here, you know, they enter their credit card information, and then one step after that, we're going to do a count by this action. Okay, you guys following so far? Okay. So here we get, you know, another little graph. We have People confirm, you know, confirm page, say, you know, do you guys want to check out? Or null, which is people just, they drop off. So when we combine all these, we can do something called funnel analysis. I don't know if you guys have looked at this stuff before, but it's, it's really understanding how people go through steps in a process where, you know, they'll, they'll start one step and then some people, you know, a lot of people might drop off and only a few do the next step and how many do the next step after that. So, for this, are you guys fun, are familiar with funnel analysis? I don't know how many people here. Okay. Uh, it's a really useful tool for optimizing for like websites or any kind of process you have. So here's a funnel query. It looks kind of big, but it's when you get into it, it's you know it's fairly intuitive actually. So we have up here at the top, we're going to talk about when people check out. You know, we're going to count, and count has an into, so you can basically put this count into a variable. We're just going to call it step zero because that's kind of you know that, that checkout that you're doing. And then if they think, can you read this too, by the way? Yes. Okay. And then if they go in and actually enter their credit card information, they'll move down in here, you do a select count into step one. 
and then he'll you know keep going. They do the confirmation. We'll sum that up into or count that up into step two. So we run that, and we get this really easy output. And there we have 100 people went to step zero, 40 went to step one, 32 went to step two. This is our checkout credit card information and confirmation. We graph this out, and this is the final analysis. So you can see, you know, people going to the checkout breath or checkout page. A lot of those people drop off by the time they get to the credit card information page. So if you really want to fix your process or your website, you know, you want to focus right here because you know. Once they get to this page right here, most of them are finishing the process. So it kind of goes this left to right. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's you know kind of figuring out that how is interesting, but you know doing this why is also really interesting. So why do users cancel accounts? And uh, this is actually you know we take the same construct of win, but we just kind of flip on its head. So we we actually use this negative sign here. So we're saying that. When someone cancels their account, move backwards in the timeline, and we can then count your dead by action. And we get that, you know, the same results that we had in the SQL query, but now it's a little bit more intuitive. So this this whole construct of when and within is pretty interesting because it's you know this is our timeline here, and you know we want to be able to move you know kind of this might be a checkout right here or some kind of action you care about. We want to be able to move you know forward and back and try to understand what people do. So this is you can see at the top within one step. So this is you know within one step means move over a step. And this is two steps. You can also do stuff like uh, like ranges. Like I want to see you know what people did in one step through three steps. We can go backwards negative one negative two. Uh, and then sessions are also an important idea because you know we don't just have a continuous stream of events from a user. You know, people come to your site and do a bunch of stuff and leave and come back in a couple days, hopefully, or some point in the future. So we're gonna break this down and you know sessions are delineated by this idle time in between. And you know, we can say within zero sessions, so that's anything that occurs within this, this session going on right now. We can say within one session, so you know, we'll be able to move to the next session and look at the next session going on. We can also look, you know, backward and see, and you know, maybe someone someone came in and canceled their account, and maybe what happened, you know, within that session isn't really important, but what happened, you know, the last session or two sessions ago that might have led up to that. And this also works on, you know, you can do arbitrary time ranges too of days and months and years. Can you change how you're um, analyzing the sessions? Uh, oh, like a fixed amount of time, or I mean, right? Or I mean, I guess you go in depending on your user experience. Your session yeah. may be totally different than someone else's. Like no, it's, uh, right now it's you can set an amount of time that elapses between like the idle time. Yeah. Um, uh, I am actually looking for more use cases around you know changing that up, uh, but I'm definitely open to, uh, to making that adjustable. But you can't do that. You yeah, you can. This is my idle time. Yeah, right. I, I typically use about two hours when I do this stuff, but you can set it thirty minutes or ten seconds. Cool. Ben, can steps be negative? Event? What's that? Can steps be negative. Yeah, it could be any event, and it's 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 pretty agnostic too. So I mean, just any kind of event data you want to put in here. So it could be an action that someone's doing. It could be some property of you know a user perhaps, so like their name or gender or some kind of other information. Um, so yeah, it's. It's pretty agnostic around the source. Okay, so so Sky is my database. I just it's this open source project I started about a year ago, and um, I always get the question, you know, after what is behavioral analytics, you know, why do you write your own database? Because it's it's kind of a weird thing to you know, undertake. So that's, that's really a big question. So why you know why build a database? So I originally started this, and I actually was trying to build this kind of stuff on top of Redis. So it's kind of you know, the fastest tool I could find out there, and it just wasn't really doing everything I wanted to. So, and I really had to kind of uh, build this language around behavior on top of that. So you know, I just kind of figured, you know, why not try to build a database? It's open source and it's fun too. So I mean, <laughs> that's kind of why I did. <laughs> so you know, there's, there's three big points. So the data model is a really big one. The, the performance and scaling is a, kind of the big three. So. So earlier in the talk, you know, that was more high level, just kind of give you guys an idea. Uh, 
kind of get a little more into the nitty gritty here. So the data model, this is you know this is fundamentally how you think about your data, and you, you know how you relate it and how you break it down and work with it. So you know you really want it to match what you're trying to do. So you, know, you have relational databases, and they work great for you know taking things and relating them to other things, and you know that's they're built like that, and they work great for you know most applications. And you're not going to rip out your database, your relational database to use Sky. This is this guy's more supplemental on top of it. So relational databases are good at relating. You know, logs, they're just a dump of everything that happened. I mean, they don't really care who did it, but they just they put it all into one block, everything. So, but it's really hard to pick out, you know, this user ID one, put an action right here, right here, and down here. So trying to actually break that out and understand it, it's hard to, to do it conceptually. So, you know, we start thinking about behavior in terms of timeline. So you have individual things you want to track, you know, a lot of times users. Um, and you might have, you know, Bob right here. This is his timeline. And he goes to your homepage, looks at a product, and then, you know, he finally checks out. And the interesting thing about, you know, behavior is that Bob right here, his timeline is in isolation. So what he does right there doesn't really relate to, to Susie down here, who comes in through maybe like a, an online ad. And she signs up, and it goes to, you know, she completed the sign up and went to the welcome page. So this property of isolation between users or things that you're tracking uh, becomes a really, a really powerful thing when you start building a database, because isolation really kind of means concurrency. So that's kind of how you know, it makes sense to, to do this, to, to look at it and think about it. So that's how we store it in Sky. So you know, you take all these little pieces of how you store it and, and whatnot. And it, it turns into some big performance gains. So you know you want to you want to lay out your data in your database. You know how you want to analyze it. So with, with Sky, we'll actually you know we'll have all these users and their timelines, and their events are just da 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 like one right after another. So when we go to analyze it, we just run straight through, and we can do a lot of stuff with like CPU caches and uh, you know how memory works, just the caching layers that really optimizes this. Um, and also, when you're when you're doing an analytics database, you don't want to do stuff like joining two big tables because it has to move all this data around. It's really slow, so we're going to do, not do that. So we have everything just how we want. It. And then finally, we, you know, we want to tightly pack all this stuff and keep it in memory as much as we can. So I'm using a message pack on, internally, and uh, it works really well for representing. You know, if you have an integer that's you know, number twenty, it takes one byte. You know, it doesn't take eight or anything. So you can pack in a lot of stuff into a pretty small space. So, and uh, this guy also has a nice property of, you know, when you're talking about behavior and users, you, know, you might set properties on a user, like their gender. Probably won't change that much. You know, but you set it one time, and you don't need to you know, set that every single time. It'll just kind of you know that from that point forward until it changes. Uh, that's how it persists. So, uh, you know, you can do about 10 million events per core per second uh, when you're analyzing stuff. And uh, just to give this some comparison, when I was doing Redis, uh, its benchmarks, you can typically typically do about um, 100,000 ops per second. And it was just not as fast as I needed to do. So you can get really like orders of magnitude faster. So, and the other interesting thing, I was talking about uh, isolation and concurrency. So this actually, it'll scale across cores. Because you know, if you have a quad-core machine, you really split the stuff out and analyze it completely independently. So yeah. Does it reduce efficiently? That's a harder problem. It's yeah, I mean, the window actually reduced down the other. But it, it, it seems that as, as far as what I've done, um, mostly analytic prob problems I've been working with, they yeah, the the reduced part's pretty pretty simple. So it'll actually it'll just run all these. It'll basically run. On, Four individual databases, or if you have a quad core machine, and then roll all that up at the end. So, yeah. so you know that that whole idea of like concurrency and isolation, you know, plays into scaling as well. So you now we have these timelines. We talked about isolation, and you can we can move those around. We can run them and uh, analyze them independently. Uh, Sky also automatically creates a sh you know a shard for every logical CPU you have, so it'll split your data up automatically. And then the next upcoming version, we'll do distribution across nodes. Uh, but I mean, with kind of analytic 
data. Typically, we you know we crunch a whole bunch of data, and it rolls up into a fairly small you know, amount of information. So, if you're spreading this across nodes, you shouldn't have you should scale pretty well. All right. So, we'll talk. About, any questions so far? Yeah. So, does the so you're splitting in people, right? So you like have Bob on one machine and Sally on the other machine, or something. We have Bob and Sally, and they could be on separate um, kind of shards or nodes. Um, and then, when you whenever you do your analysis, we only care about one of those timelines at a time. And we'll just run through each one, and the results from that analysis get rolled up into a single single value of cash. Bob and Sally on the same machine. Bob and Sally come on the same. Yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, when they get rolled up. Yeah. Yeah, they'll roll up. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're doing a typical analysis, how much time are you spending shredding the logs in the timelines versus doing actual analytics? What do you mean shredding the logs? Well, like, I mean, how do you get the timelines? Well, so whenever, so, oh, how do you get so the data? I've got, got data from somewhere, it's not uh, it's stored as timelines, right? It's yeah, so what you get, or, if you get stuff like, um, so we just, so it's kind of really works with events. So we have like a log file, for instance, each line of that log is going to be an event. Right. And you can push that into Skyline um, just through an API. It's a JSON API, uh, JSON over HTTP. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that once you had it set up, you would, excuse me, you would keep track of those events in real time. But if you have a bunch of data, there's some sort of like ELTs. I was just saying. Yeah, if you have a, yeah. Yeah. If you have a bunch of data, you'll have to import it manually. Uh, and we're adding tools as well for importers. Uh, into it, but yeah, you just push your data in to this kind of to this format, and once it's in there, okay, then you you do the analysis. But you don't want it to be done once to get in there. Oh yeah. So um, I work on, a, on an application that um, has a very long session time, like maybe a week long. So if we uh, record that entire session, you splice it into individual timelines, and then analytics on that. So you have. So it could be like the, the idle time in between is a week, or the actual whole session is a whole session like a week. Okay. And say you want to just look at one piece of it. Oh, one little subsection of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it stores it, it'll store the, the entire timeline. It actually doesn't even care about sessions when it stores it. It's really just a series of events right. over time. Right. So when you actually go in and actually want to do, if you want to do a subsection of that, you can kind of play around with that with the the when and within gotcha. you know some amount of time or a number of steps. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay, so the, some of the internal stuff, the little nitty gritty stuff. Um, I originally wrote this all in C and rewrote it probably about four times. Uh, I've recently redone this in Go. Uh, I really feel like this is the final final time. <laughs> um, it, I feel yeah, it's, a, it's, a good, it's in a good place. So the query engine itself is written in C still just to get the performance, uh, but it's actually a fairly small piece of it all. Um, it's, it's fairly simple when you actually really look at it. Um, I originally wrote the storage layer, which is a huge, huge pain in the ass, let me tell you. So I eventually moved that out, and uh, I actually store it in level DB underneath, just to do stuff like uh, you know, managing prop files, if something goes wrong or whatnot, it does that autom automatically. And then uh, the API is RESTful JSON over HTTP. So you can hit this with a web browser or, or curl if you wanted to, and it's pretty easy to play around with. Uh, also there's yeah, there's a concept of a, a schema, obviously. Yeah, this is some kind of structured data. But you know, we don't have a limit on columns. You can kind of add them as hoc, or ad hoc. And uh, you know, when, you're, when it actually stores the events on your, your timeline, it doesn't store you know, every value for every column. It just stores the delta, just the little change for each one. So all the events are pretty small. And as you add you know, these columns onto there, these properties, um, it doesn't have to go back and re-add anything. It just adds it automatically. Uh, so we can store strings, integers, floats, booleans, and basic types. Uh, nothing too fancy yet. Uh, it uses message, message pack underneath, so adding stuff like maps and arrays, dates, lat long, that kind of stuff is actually it's pretty easy to add. Um, I'm, I'm really mainly looking for the use cases just to make sure I'm not adding a bunch of features on here that no one's going to use. Uh, and finally, the actual the query system, the yeah, the query system, the query engine underneath. Uh, so it runs some C in there, but the actual query when it generates, it'll actually generate a Lewis script underneath, um, and that Lewis script will describe how to 
to move through this timeline. And that gets compiled via LuaJIT, uh, LuaJIT. I don't know if you've ever played around with this thing. It's wicked fast. And it's like half the speed of C, but it's compiled just on the fly. So anyway, that's how I get the performance from what I'm doing. Uh, it used to be LLVM based, but that also was kind of a pain, so I moved away from that. Um, so that's kind of, you guys have any questions so far? Yeah. So you stored a message pack in the data store, mm -hmm. and like you're actually parking it down to event A to a key value at time stamp? Uh, so actually, it's it's even simpler than that. So if you actually look at it, you have, so uh, level DB is a, a key value store, um, and it's, it's pretty fast too, it was made by Google. And the key is your object identifier, some kind of like a user ID if you want to. And then the value is actually a serialization of the entire timeline. So you have, you know, like, it's just a, basically an array of events with timestamps on them that have some kind of delta above the data going on. Does that make sense? All right, so any other questions? Is that okay? Just real, real quickly, yeah. you use Go because of the concurrency benefits? Um, you know, the concurrency is nice. Uh, it's mainly, it's just a, it's a nice language for, uh, you know, it does a lot of stuff around, like, you have to do explicit error handling, like, very explicit, and it's very simple. It feels a lot like C, like, uh, just the very straightforwardness of it, but without all the, the pain in the stuff. So. Okay. Uh, so this is, so, you know, some stuff that's coming up in the sky and kind of what I'm working on and, you know, what's coming down the pipe. So the, the win operators and stuff like that has all been SQL-like. Um, there's actually a JSON API right now, which is pretty much analogous to what we've seen so far with the win. Um, but, you know, the JSON API is really nice when you actually want to build an application on top of it. But if you're a human being and actually just want to do ad hoc queries, it's kind of a pain. So, uh, I'm going to be adding a SQL like layer on top that will pile down. Uh, multi node distribution, uh, we talked about this briefly. And this is just, you know, you know if you want to put this in a production system and actually have it scale up and uh, have high availability, then you know, it's pretty neat. Uh, predictive behavioral analytics is another cool thing, you know, we'll talk about machine learning. But, you know, a lot of the tools of machine learning talk about, you know, they take, they try to predict future behavior with some kind of state about the users, you know. But, you know, I find it really fascinating to think about, you know, can we do better to figure out future behavior based on past behavior? And I think that Sky's really set up to do that well in the future. Uh, another thing, so I've been doing you know, this, this Sky project for about a year or so. Uh, it's gotten a little more serious. I started doing some work around it. And, uh, and I'm building a product on top, on top of it called Landmark. Uh, it's a hosted analytics product. You can go to landmark.io. It's, it's going into beta you know, soon. So just throw in your email address, and I'll uh, let you guys know if you guys are interested. And uh, yeah, I'll give you guys a, a quick demo here of kind of stuff that, you know, what this looks like when you actually build an app on top of it. So, oh, yeah. okay, can you guys see this? I know the text is a little hard to read. So, this data right here, so, you know, I need some kind of public data set. And uh, the GitHub, or GitHub, you guys probably will use that. Uh, it has this, these events that occur whenever someone does anything with a public repository. So, you, can do, you know, it'll track the stuff like push events whenever you push code to a uh, Open source project or create your watch events down here, you know, people doing stuff with issues, and then we kind of roll up all the other little tiny events uh, into one little block. And, you know, uh, you know that they archive all this stuff for public use, so I just pulled, you know, a little a data set down. So this is about 2 million records we're working with, and this is just, you know, people that are on GitHub doing open source work and kind of what they do. So, you know, we can kind of we can come in here and we can kind of see you know, those. 596,847 people that were, you know, did a push event you know, at some point. This is about a month's worth of data. So, you know, they did a push to some kind of public repository. And, you know, maybe we want to see, you know, what did they do immediately after that push? You know, we can also kind of build a histogram on some of the numeric properties, like how many forks there are on that project they pushed to, or how many people that watched it or started. You guys familiar with GitHub? Yes, okay. So, you know, we can filter by maybe the language. Username is probably not a good one. Yeah. So, if we look at uh, next actions here, we bust this out, and we'll see. So, this is a push event. And here we can see everything that occurred immediately after 
the push button. Push button. So this is you know one step after. We can go in. You can you know we can see that 185,000 people did that push, and then you know people did a couple other little things down here, and a bunch of these other ones that didn't do anything is people that just did a push and didn't do with anything within two hours. So all these people dropped off. So we can actually keep on drilling in. And every time we do a click on here, it's recomputing all 2 million events in the database. And because of that, we don't actually have to roll up anything beforehand. So we can drill in to find you know, everyone that did four pushes and then created a repository or something random. You know? Or we can start jumping back and kind of, you know, we can really play around with this stuff. It's interesting too. So we can see you know, people that push, they typically push again. Or people that, you know, that watch, they'll go in and they'll actually, you know, watch another repository. This makes sense. It's, you know, the behaviors are very much siloed on GitHub. And GitHub's actually not the best data set for this because they don't really have kind of uh, tasks, like multi step tasks. But it's public and that's what we have available. So, you know, we're looking at people that watch and watch again. Um, if we go back, you know, people that, you know, work on issues down here. You know, we can see that people that work on issues continue to work on issues. So, you know, they stay in their silos. So, you know, it's kind of playing around and you can do cool stuff where, you know, you can look at, you know, people that created a repository. I think this is kind of a fun little data point. So, you know, you can break this down here if you wanted to by language. You know, you can see that people, you know, this is Java right here. You know, JavaScript people that, you know, do these creations and stuff like that. You can kind of break it down by these different language types. Um, we can also start diving in. So actually, real quick, let me show you. So the language on there, you know, Java, JavaScript, these are the most popular languages. You know, they're up towards the top. But if we actually drill in, we can say, let's look at people that created a repository. And then immediately after that, here's a delete event. You know, people created a repository. Obviously, they messed up. And they're like, oh, I should delete this. You know, and those people typically that, that delete after they create, they go and create again. So that, that makes sense. You know, they're just, they messed up something, they're going to go fix it again. And, you know, and some of those people that created then went back and deleted again. You know, they just, they just can't get it right. You know, and, and we can continue drilling in. It's pretty fun just to play around. That's the, that's the key question. So before our top languages were JavaScript and Java, uh, but if we filter by language, you know, Ruby is the top. <laughs> top people that just can't get it right. And I, I am actually a Ruby, so I'm, I'm making fun of myself a little bit. So it's, you know, it's, this is really interesting stuff. You can really kind of drill through and really, you don't have to ask, you don't have to know these questions up front to ask you to really explore your data, which is, it's really key when you're getting into behavioral analytics because, you know, a lot of times you don't actually know what questions to ask. So, you know, you can kind of dive in, play around, click around, and, um, histograms are actually working on the, the server side. I just don't have it implemented. This, this front end is called Skybox. Everything's prefixed with Sky. It's a theme. Um, so histograms will work soon, but you can basically, if you want to hit, you know, show, create, a, create events and split those out by you know, how, many, you know, how many forks there are. So you know, small number of forks, mid, you know, medium level, or amount of forks, or however many. You, know, you can split your data by this uh, numerical information. So, that's the, that's the basic demo of kind of playing around and kind of seeing these steps and how that plays out with behavior. Um, so, go back real quick. Um, so, yeah, just any questions you guys have? Yeah. What you use for the front end visualization? Uh, that is D3 up there. And, oh, that is. Yeah, it's D3. Um, and I was originally using the there's a Sankey diagram that they have out there, but I kind of rewrote my own uh, just to kind of get that that drilling in piece. Because really, when you get into the behavioral stuff, you want to drill down. And you know, as you get further and further down, the lines get smaller and smaller. So you really have to change your uh, your domain, your range uh, within there to kind of see what's going on. Yep. How hard is it to include other dimensions in uh, in your data set to uh, sort of combine? Uh, demographics or anything like that with uh, the actions. Oh, um, I mean, it's, it's not it's not hard at all, actually. I mean, it's it's agnostic. It's a it's a really simple data model. Um, so you have so each user. I'll tell you how it's stored. So it's, I describe it as a partially transient hash. Let me see how much time I have. 
Um, I described it as partially transient hash. So each user has this state about it, and that's you know represents its gender or that person's gender or their, you know where they live, and stuff like that. And those are kind of persistent properties that exist. Once you set them, they persist over time um, until they get changed. Uh, and there's also transient properties you can set. So you can say, you know, this piece, this action, might have other related data about it that only exists for that moment. And in the next, you know, event or you know, a second later, you really don't care about that stuff. It doesn't exist anymore. So you can set that up. There's a schema you can set up with it. Um, that basically states the data type and the whether it's transient or not and the name. But you can add that stuff as you go ad hoc. And there's not a limit on it. Um, I mean, whatever a 64 bit inch integer you know, goes up to, but uh, hopefully you don't have any properties. So it's Skyline Labs, is that the company that's yeah. monitoring this product? Uh, it's just, I started doing a data consultancy uh, just a couple months ago. And uh, so Sky is actually its name. After Skyline, which is my neighborhood up in Denver, so a little Denver shout out. Um, so yeah, Skyline Labs is just my, my own data consultancy right now. But so I'm building out Sky and just you know. So do you have like how many people are contributing with you or? Just uh, there's, a hand, there's a handful of people. Um, you know, we had presentations given on it. I know this guy at Tokyo that gave a presentation on it. It's weird to hear like when you put stuff out there that people just pick it up and you know present on it or do stuff with it. Uh, there's a handful of you know contributors that are starting to do more stuff. And, yeah, it's, it's coming along. Any other? You guys have any other questions? Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, you can head to the website.